Welcome to Climate Change and Health in Small Island Developing States, focused on the Caribbean. If you require translation into Spanish or French, please use the link posted in the chat and choose your desired language at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You should continue to keep this current browser open as well to utilize the chat and Q&A features. Please be sure to scroll down and mute the video. Please use the Q&A feature to submit any questions for the panelists. This session is being recorded. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I want to take the opportunity to welcome everybody to this, our webinar for our conference, Climate Change and Health in Small Island Developing States, Focus on the Caribbean. And of course, this is being brought to us by the Yale Center for Climate Change and Health. I'm excited to be here. We have an exciting team of panelists. This session will address how climate change has affected agriculture, fisheries, and freshwater in the Caribbean region and the implications for food and water security and certainly health. I start off by saying that climate change is a reality for us in the Caribbean. And it's, it's no coincidence that this, this wonderful webinar and webinar series is happening the same time as we're having the Caribbean Week of Agriculture that addresses also these three issues. We are seeing as it relates to health, we're seeing challenges that are directly linked to climate change. We're seeing challenges that relate to water insecurity as a need for water, um, saline intrusion, among other things, and critical for food security. We're seeing challenges being brought about in the era of food security. A recently concluded World, World Food Program, CARICOM studies, identified a significant increase in the incidence of food insecurity in the Caribbean region. And certainly this has been brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. As I said, we have an interesting and world interesting and world-class panelist here for us today. And we have Mr. Paciento Wenfield, and he's a policy officer in the environment and climate change of the FAO sub-regional office in the Caribbean. He has studied environmental engineering at the University of Florida, specializing in wetland system water treatment, then earned his master's degree at the University of California in ecological, ecological engineering. Over the past 13 years, he has focused on climate change, particularly in the areas of ecology alternatives in water sanitation, nature-based solution for climate change adaptation and mitigation, climate finance, private sector engagement and microfinancing. He also worked from 2012 to 2020 at the UNDP, UNEP's regional office for Latin America and the Caribbean. And he primarily managed microfinancing, microfinancing for ecosystems based adaptation projects, which he implemented in six Latin American countries and two in Africa. He joined the FAO in 2021 and he's now the coordinator of the Caribbean Resilient Initiative and Sub-Regional Office for the Caribbean, where he manages the GEF and GCE project pipelines. I'm also pleased to announce today to have Dr. Adrian Cashman, and he's an international consultant, and his main topics has to do with impacts of climate change and water security, and some implications, including health. Dr. Cashman has over 40 years experiences in the water sector. He has, has been working as an international consultant based in the island state of Barbados on projects across the region, addressing the water sector having to do with policy development, climate change impact, and project de development in general. Prior to 2018, he spent 12 years at the University of the West Indies, serving as a director for the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies and leading the water resources management, water resources management postgrad teaching and research programs. As a teacher and a mentor, he has trained a significant cohort of young Caribbean water professionals. Dr. Cashman has published several works covering a diverse range of fields, including critical accounting, geography, and water. Welcome. I also have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Sandra Grant, and she's the roses are among the thorns here. 
Dr. Grant is currently the executive deputy executive director for the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism Secretariat. Dr. Grant, Dr. Grant has worked for over 26 years in the fisheries sector in the, throughout the Caribbean region. She, has, she recently joined as a deputy executive director for the CRFM, where she's responsible for assisting in overall management and coordination of technical programs, ensuring that systems for scientific and technical quality control are developed. One such activity is to enhance the regional and national frameworks to monitor climate change impacts on the fisheries and aquaculture sectors. I forgot to tell you that I am Sean Baugh and I'm program manager for agriculture and agro-industrial development working at the CARICOM Secretariat. Without further ado, I'll invite our first speaker, Asiento, to take us through. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so let me give you a, an introductory uh, presentation presentation on how climate change is affecting our food systems and what are the health implications on that. So uh, in this first, uh, sorry, in this first slide, uh, the idea, this is from the IPCC special report on climate change and land, uh, chapter five on food security. So this is quite interesting to see how interlinked uh, the systems are. We can see that uh, food production both suffers from the consequences of climate change or the impact of climate change, but it's also a producer of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's, it's on both ends that we can work in agriculture, we can work on mitigation actions, and we can work on adaptation actions. Of course, mitigation is to reduce the level of greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation is how do we uh, cope with those uh, impacts that we're suffering. So we can see that um, ecosystems play a big uh, role in our food production. Uh, food systems actually have a very strong correlation to health uh, and, and, and human uh, well being. Uh, the socioeconomic system has a very strong impact also on the food system, and it is all influenced by uh, cl the climate system. So you can see that there are many, there are going to be impacts from climate change in many areas, and we're going to uh, discuss this a little bit further. For example, we would like to first show um, why the Caribbean has these intrinsic conditions that make it more vulnerable to climate change. First, we can see that the, we're talking about small island development states that have last, vast masses of water surrounding small islands or small masses of land. Uh, where they're increasingly urbanized, so increasing there's very uh, little space to do agriculture. We can see that uh, in most SIDS, we have uh, less than 40% of the land that is suitable for agriculture through, due to urbanization and other processes. And the, because of the small scale, we also have to see that uh, this conducts to small scale agriculture, uh, which is typically influenced by low productivity and a low access to markets. You, we know that the, there is a high dependence on food imports, uh, and also that these foods that are being imported are usually processed uh, in high content of sugar and fat, and usually are more affordable than local products, uh, which sort of creates a vicious circle. And if we add other aspects for the system, for example, we can see that there is a lack of efficient management of water resources. And as an example, 85% of the wastewater that we're seeing uh, entering the, the Caribbean Sea uh, is untreated. So this creates a huge uh, impact for, for availability of water resources, for fresh food, and uh, results in a lack of access uh, to healthy food, healthy diets for uh, low-income, most vulnerable populations. Now let's talk, to talk a little bit about how climate drivers impact different aspects of the food system. So if we say, for example, uh, we know that temperatures are going to increase. It's very clear that that would have some effects on coral bleaching, for example, and that would have some effects in terms of uh, adding the risk of 
crop failure in our um, in our production and also increase mortality of, of cattle, for example. And then if we keep add, adding impacts, for example, the changes in rainfall patterns, how this is going to affect uh, shifts, uh, shift, shift, uh, shifting in the length of the growing season, season, how that's gonna change in terms of crop suitability areas where you can grow certain crops. Uh, that you're going to require additional inputs to have the same levels of production, be it more fertilizer, more water, uh, et cetera. And that we would have to cope also because of increased temperature, increased uh, changes in rainfall patterns in terms of incidence on pests and diseases. If we add an additional layer and we say, okay, how is intense periods of rainfall going to, to have an effect on the system? Well, we know that we're more prone to have crop damage or loss. And then when we add the increased temperature, the changes in the rainfall patterns and increased periods of rainfall leading to flooding, for example, we're gonna have uh, decreased uh, livestock and aquaculture productivity. Then if we add sea level rise, uh, we're gonna see that that shortens or reduces the amount of available fresh water in aquifers that leads to a decline in variability in terms of the availability of freshwater resources. And that we are gonna have loss of agricultural lands due to erosion and some coastal flooding. So increasing the, the risk of uh, failure of crops and damage to crops and lower productivity in general. Then if we add, for example, extreme weather events, hurricanes or intense rainstorms, then we have physical damage to crops and livestock, damage to infrastructure, of course, coral bleaching as well. You can see then how the situation can be quite complicated when we start adding all these impacts and how they're all interlinked and how they all feed into one another. Then when we go into the, the effects on the, on the health system, and then we see, for example, how, how would temperature increase affect food availability? Just by thinking about how much food can be wasted or damaged because of increased uh, temperature, you can see the, the health impacts that that can happen. Uh, in, in terms of if you have extreme rainfall, how that would have limitations in terms of accessing food, uh, whether it's, it's a road that is destruct, uh, damaged or uh, people don't get access to markets and how that can, can uh, increase the level of dependency of import products. In terms of food use, for example, uh, food safety, managing uh, the, the different products and how we need to be more careful in terms of preventing uh, diarrheal diseases and other types of diseases. Uh, in terms of the reduce in nutrition quality in products, so we need to eat more or produce more of other types of foods. Uh, in terms of the available seafood proteins because of uh, warming acid and acidification in the ocean. Um, and all these, have an effect in terms of the health um, impact. And then as food stability. So we are talking about instability in prices and in terms of a stress to actually uh, get our food, uh, yeah, access to, to food. So the climate is going to impact all levels of the four pillars of what we call food security. And then what can we do? Well, we need to start implementing decision-making tools trying to promote local agricultural production and consumption. So farmers markets, uh, school feeding programs that we're doing in certain projects, having ensuring that we have local production and consumption is essential. Ensuring that we have an integrated water resource management approach, that we use efficient irrigation systems, uh, that we uh, ensure that we, we use appropriate technology, for example, solar uh, hydroponics, uh, solar dryers, for, for processing of food and to have some means of having disincentives for certain types of products, for example, uh, high sugar products. And I was talking in, a diff, in another webinar, how if we can ever have some type of uh, a tracer, what is our um, level of use of sugar and how, how can we have uh, in, in, like those traces of the issue of sugar, for example, our, footprint in terms of uh, global uh, carbon stocks when we use import food. 
and now trying to get into, into climate smart agriculture, uh, building resilience uh, overall in, in the system so that we can address both health and climate change uh, impacts. So finally, this is my last slide. Um, these are what we, could, we should focus on. Integrated approach, approaches to build resilience, for example. We're doing this in Dominica, trying to develop a project for the Green Climate Fund, dealing with agricultural health and education sectors. Uh, you can see that I did not use a lot of data in my, in my presentation. I think it, this is a major concern in the region. There's lack of data, so we need to get more generation of data, management interpretation for those who are going to use that data. I think there's there are sufficient funds, but we need to have a better coordination among those who are implementing projects to make sure that we are efficient in the delivery and that we actually can produce the results that are intended. And uh, as we're doing in, in a project in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, accessing funds uh, from the Green Climate Fund to develop a green recovery strategy uh, dealing with uh, COVID and uh, health issues and trying to develop um, concept notes to access for additional finance for nature-based solutions. So I'll leave it there and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Asiento. Beautiful and, 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 and incisive. You, have, you took us through linkages, the effects, the impacts, you linked it to availability, utilization, access and stability. And more importantly, you took us as to what are the practical workable solutions, local consumption re reduction of sugary foods, sugary products, climate smart, agriculture, and finally, an integrated approach to building resilience. Thank you very much. I'll move straight into our next presenter, and I'll just ask that Dr. Cashman could just proceed accordingly. Well, thank you very much um, for that introduction. And I, one of the thing, one of the things that has struck me just listening to our last presentation is the number of overlaps that there are between the agricultural sector and and, and the water sector. And I think for before I get into to what I was wanting to present, one of the things it does highlight is that you can't manage water without managing managing land. And I think it's also interesting that actually this week is the Caribbean Water and Wastewater Association's annual conference as well. So uh, th that just highlights, the, I think, the number of overlaps that there are. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges facing the water sector and, and, and water security. And I'd like to break it up into two parts. There, first of all, there are the challenges facing the water resource itself, and then there's challenges of making that water resource available to uh, where, it's, where it's needed. So if we first look at the challenges facing the resource, we've already heard uh, Jacinto talking a little bit about the challenges of, of variability and changes in extreme weather conditions. And that includes both um, fast onset events, such as hurricanes and storms, and slow onset events such as uh, dry periods and drought. Um, one of the things that we worry about uh, and, and it challenges us is this idea that water resources are variable in, in time and in space. As in other words, there's variability within a year, between years, and also within countries. And you could see a little bit of that in that a diagram down in the bottom right hand corner there, where if you look, that's Jamaica, the um, lowest rainfall but heaviest population is in the Kingston St. Andrew area. And yet that's uh, where the water resources are, um, where there's plentiful resources are quite far removed. And that obviously adds challenge. We've heard a little bit about water, uh, saline intrusion. Um, the, we haven't heard too much about use of agrochemicals um, as just one example, not the only one, but one of the things that also we're worried about is chemically induced droughts. In other words, the, the, the extent to which um, we're using chemicals, we're polluting our aquifers and therefore making them unavailable for, for use. And that I think 
is, is an issue that has been highlighted. What I've done here is to try and look at a couple of the measures of water availability. And I've highlighted two of the most popular ones. There's the water stress index, which uh, is used in uh, SDG six. And then there's the total renewable water resources uh, per person. And what I've done is, is I've mapped uh, the countries across the Caribbean. Those down in the bottom right hand side, Belize, Suriname, Guyana, as you can see from that, don't really, as you would expect, have too much of an issue. But as we go diagonally across this diagram going upwards, we get into situations such as uh, Barbados find itself in, in that it is highly water stressed and the amount of water, renewable water per person is actually quite, is quite low. It's around uh, 200 uh, cubic meters per person per year. Other countries like St. Kitts and Nevis, Dominican Republic are sort of moving, uh, moving in those directions of water stress and scarcity. So this is, this though is very much a, a, a general and average measure. And what it doesn't do is highlight the variability across time. And I've tried to capture this a little bit by using the Dr Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is a measure of drought, and highlighting um, a couple of countries. You see St. Lucia there, which is perhaps representative of the Eastern Caribbean. And you can see that there, although, if we were to look at the, go back to the first diagram and see that there is water, water is uh, seems to be readily available there. If you look at the way the dry seasons have panned out over time, this goes to illustrate the variability that there is um, between years. And this is a particular challenge when we come to infrastructure. This is a one from a uh, diagram from St. Vincent and the Grenadines and showing variability in the flow of water and the abstraction there. And at times of year, abstraction is equaling more or less the stream flow. This is not, uh, this is not every case that we, that we see, but it does illustrate that, that in certain places, we do, we do have the challenges there. So when I turn to water services, the challenges, if we were to characterize them very broadly, would be ones of challenges of governance. Things like uncertainty of finances. If we're uncertain of finances, we can't address our aging infrastructure. Aging infrastructure can lead us to increased losses from, from our pipelines, poor service coverage. Human resource capacity is, is an issue, I think, an issue that, um, we need to pay a bit more attention to because we are losing our resource capacity with our younger people leaving the region uh, because there are not the opportunities that there for them to enter into the water sector. And if you put all this together, you get a vicious circle in water and sanitation where because of poor coverage, you, it's difficult to raise the finances, you lose political support. Um, and it's one of the reasons why our water sector is, is very challenged in trying to live up to the expectations of, uh, of the consumers. Um, this is another one that just shows, it illustrates that it's levels of non-revenue water in layman's language, that's uh, water loss from system. And although it's a very small, um, a, ve a very small snapshot of a number of countries, you can see that from this that we've got levels of leakage uh, ranging up from 50 to 75 percent in some cases it's from a recent report um, uh, by the Inter-American Development Bank. Yeah. Um, so in terms of water availability, trying to bring that all together, we see that many countries of water, municipal water demand is the greatest, um, greater of all the sectors. Um, there is competition for water, but it's limited to a few countries. Agriculture is not, a, at the moment, in most countries, not a major consumer because it's mainly rain fed. But if we look to, and, and bear in mind some of the things that have been hearing earlier, that if we want to try and um, address some of the food insecurities, then this could lead us to greater demand for water. Um, 
Marked wet and dry season can result in water insecurity across sectors. Some countries are already experiencing seasonally constrained demand. Um, and I'm not going to talk about the, the, the food import substitution and the impact on water resources. I've touched a little bit on it just now. So what are the prospects? I'm going to go very quickly through this. Um, this is something for uh, from about the climate prospects. I've just chosen Dominica here. And generally speaking, most um, climate models project uh, a, a drying trend, reduction in rainfall. Obviously, it depends on the which uh, climate scenario you look at and which period of time that you look at. But this can be replicated across most of the Eastern Caribbean and other, Car and other parts of the Caribbean as well. Um, number of dry spells, generally increasing number of dry spells, again, depending on climate projections and the time slice there. So what does this tell us then? The climate prospects, less water availability, greater variability, dry spells, increased temperature, and the imp so that's on the climate side, the water resources side, on the impact that that is likely to have, we see greater competition from a more variable resource. This will inevitably involve higher cost of provision. We get disruptions of supplies, and we've seen when supplies are disruptive, disruptive, um, there's increased use of unsafe, unsafe sources. Uh, we see deterioration of water quality, and we shouldn't all forget the impact that these changes can also have on ecosystems and ecosystem services. Interestingly, though, it is driving increased interest in the use of treated wastewater for a number of purposes. So potential health impacts, trying to now bring it a little to the health side, and I, with my final slide, floods and fast onset events having mental health impacts, but also increases in illness and, and injury. Uh, impact on water associated disease vectors, increase in diarrheal diseases, and increased burden on health service and infrastructure, not only from the numbers of persons maybe needing additional health services, access to additional health services, but also the impact on the health infrastructure itself. So those are just a few thoughts. I've gone through it very quickly. And obviously, I'd love to take some questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cashman. To sum up, you, you have taken us beautifully through water availability. You have linked us as it relates to government policies within the region and the actions that can be taken so that can be scaled up and, and replicated accordingly. And certainly you have linked it to the impact, the future of water and the impact as a result of climate change, certainly on the health sector and the challenges which lie ahead. I'll ask Dr. Grant to just move into her presentation. Dr. Grant. Sandra, I think you're muted. Sorry about that, Sean. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me now, Sean? Loud and clear, Dr. Dan. Loud and clear. Proceed. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. So, yes, today my task is to talk about the impact of climate change on fisheries, and I also want to add aquaculture and its health implications. So starting off with our climate hazards as it, as it affects our aquatic and plants and animals, we have temperature, we have ocean acidification, some of the issues, salinity and the tropical storms and hurricanes that frequently passes us in this region. Those climate hazards, they have an impact on the plants and animals, mainly our coral reefs. Our first speaker talked a little bit about that. Um, mentioned that actually. Um, it affects seaweed, 
And we are seeing it affecting fish in terms of we have now a number of invasive species and it affects our shellfish. So what are those impacts? For the coral reef, we're seeing quite a bit of coral bleaching. 2019 was just the worst we have seen, like our corals went white in uh, most of our reserve areas in, in throughout the region and also here in, in Belize. There is also the influx of sargassum across the region. And we're trying to figure out what, what's the best way to, to, to utilize the, the excess sargassum. We saw a number of, for seaweeds, we also, for the aquaculture product, the mariculture production of seaweed, we saw diseases that we have, we have never encountered such as ice ice disease, I'm sorry, ice ice disease um, for our seaweed cult in our seaweed cultivation farms. And also the, the changes in our habitat suitabilities, but also we are finding that for countries that rely on our conch and lobster resources, as for lobster, we are seeing the softening of these shells. And what the impacts are is that there's going to be economic loss for fishers and for fishing communities. There's going to be food insecurity as it relates to fish production. And also there's the nutritional component of it that I will talk about later. So what we know is that the region and we have done, we have recently completed some studies and research on the CRFM that is in between 2018 to 2020, we have completed a number of, of studies and I'm gonna present some of the findings today. So we know the region is projected to become warmer, less oxygenated with higher acidity and salinity levels um, and lower primary production throughout the 21st century. And as you can look at the graph, um, you are seeing change in temperature, temperatures going up and we're talking about sea surface temperatures. And we're seeing it going from light red to dark red because of the intense the intensity of the sea surface temperature as it gets warmer. Um, we note that virtually no species, including commercially important fish species, are expected to, um, to be spared the negative impacts on the, the future climate. The graph on your left looks at the temperature range for the pelagic species. We're talking about our tunas. Um, you notice that the temperature range is very is small, but when it comes to the demersal, they have a wider um, temperature range. But you also notice that the max is about at 30 degrees Celsius. Now the, the graph on your right is, was taken from the Turniff Atoll um, Marine Reserve here in Belize between 2017 and 2019. And that's sea surface temperature. And as you can see, um, we are up as high as over 32 degrees Celsius. So what does, that what does that imply for us in terms of fish species? A lot of us, if, if these temperature continues, we are not going to see a number of our fish species if there's if no adaptation. So we know that their suitable habitats are projected to suffer decline across most of the Caribbean region, resulting in high levels of local extinctions, as well as consequence of species distributions, composition and abundance, the potential fish catches are projected to decline across the region. So there will be a reduction in the, uh, the availability of fish for our coastal communities across the region here. Um, there'll be reduced access to commercially important species. There'll be a shift in the market the dynamics. Um, so basically what we're seeing is that if we're used to the snappers here, snappers in one area, you might end up with another type of species that the population may, may not be used to. The most vulnerable and at-risk species to climate change are of high value species such as our grouper, our snappers, um, and our parrot fishes. Um, we are seeing catchability. We are projected that by 2050, um, in a low emission scenario, we are expecting a decline of 10 to 30%, but in a high emission, it's as high as 60%, sorry. And then of course there will be a decline in snappers and groupers um, from 50 to 
So we're getting smaller catches and the supply disruption, there was supply disruptions and all this has economic impacts. Uh, we're projecting that based on the studies, we're projecting that there will be an increase in fish prices of plus 7%. There'll be an alter in the patterns of how households consume fish. And we're estimating that the daily fish consumption will reduce by 2020, 2050. So recognizing that the Caribbean is most vulnerable and noting the SDGs goals of goals 13 and 14, and recognizing that the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism, Caribbean Community Common Fisheries Policy, and its protocol on climate change adaptation and disaster risk management, we aim to try to reduce our climate impacts, whether it's to reduce our carbon dioxide emission or utilize sustainable fisheries management tools, um, resilience of habitats and improve our coastal zone management. But the threat is to our fish production. So we need to do sustainable fish, um, we need to have sustainable fish production. And in order for us to do that, we need to focus a lot on habitat and harvest management actions. We need to look at economic diversification. We need to look at climate smart. I hear a lot of people talk about climate smart agriculture. I want to put in my coin, we need climate smart fisheries value chain systems in order to maintain or to sustain as much as possible our fish productions. But we have our not, we have gaps. We, there's data needs. There's data needs for monitoring. There's data needs for sites for action. There's data needs for vulnerability of species and habitat con conditions. And a lot of, I must say, a lot of work has been done in the past couple of years in order to fill some of these data gaps, but there are other information that are required. Then there's the economic consequences of this lower catch. We need to understand that. But also, I see a lot of marine spatial planning being done at the the land-based level, and a lot more needs to be done in the marine environment. Threats to human health. We see that fish is critical, is a critical source of micronutrients that is important for growth, cognitive development, and immune functions. With the fish decline we're expecting, it's predicted that over 10% of global population would face these micronutrients and fatty acid deficiencies. We need nutrient, nutrition sensitive fisheries policy. And we have started that at the Caribbean Regional Fisheries Mechanism with our, recent, with our newly approved third strategic plan that focuses on promoting improved access and consumption of nutritious fish and seafood. But also we need nutrition sensitive food systems um, based on fish and I applaud the work been done by the World Fish and Dr. Tasheld in Asia, Pacific, and Africa. But there are knowledge gaps. We need innovative fish products with improved nutritional values. We need research on the nutritional value and consumption of fish by age group. What is the requirement in this region for um, the, the fish type and the availability of the nutritional values to mothers, pregnant mother, pregnant women, and children. We need to look at nutrition education and awareness programs about fish and strengthening the nutrition sensitive policies. Thank you. Over to you, Sean. Thank you much, Doc, Dr. Grant. Beautiful, beautiful presentation. Certainly the, the level of work that has been put out in terms of research that you spoke about, the impact on the sea, the catch, the reduction in the catch, the diseases that we're seeing, the physical effects that we're seeing in the fish, it's the fish themselves, and certainly the solutions that you spoke about in going forward. In particular, I take away from this, as you spoke about climate smart fish value chain, and the need for innovation as it relates to nutritious fish products. I think the solutions and the presentation that has been made certainly by our panelists here are, if you ask me, insightful, game-changing and eye-opening. 
And I dare say, based on the questions that I've seen coming through already, will spark quite a level of discussion. And I think we should move directly into that. And the first question I'm seeing coming from our virtual audience has to do, SIDS in the Caribbean are very limited, have very limited fertile land paired with small fragile watershed. Expanding housing and squatting are eroding this. How do we resolve this dilemma? And I think I would put that probably to, to Dr. Cashman, if you could take on that for me. Yes, well, thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, it's um, it, the expansion, it, expansion of development of, of, of urbanized areas. I think it's already been touched on to a certain extent. And uh, we're definitely seeing, um, because of the limited land areas, uh, competition for those, la for those land areas. Um, part of it goes down go, goes back to land to planning and physical planning and having proper systems of physical planning in place and i mean personally i think we're not using some of our urban infrastructure our urban areas to the to the greatest extent that we could be using them um we're tending to want to go out and have our own pieces of land and i think that is a that's a worrying prospect. It's also a worrying prospect from another point of view, because as we harden the surfaces, we're actually contributing to things like flooding problems as well when we have intense rainfall. Um, so, and there's also a, a, a pollution, can be a pollution aspect to it as well. But I think there are some, uh, Yacinto might also be able to add to this conversation. Yes, gladly, thank you. Uh, I think a, a good solution that we can start applying, and actually we're trying to develop this in one of my projects, is uh, first we need access to water, right? So how do we uh, implement some type of rainwater harvesting method? So for example, we're trying to, to spread across uh, four countries that we're working on a, a tool that was developed by the Center for International Tro uh, Agric Tropical Agriculture, the CIAT. And um, in, in to help governments define where they can access uh, rainwater harvesting, right? So the, where do you, do you physically build the structures? And then from there, uh, through a, a, a partnership with Amsterdam Peel University, we're trying to see where we can locate urban gardens. So with that water, you can locate urban gardens because in, in small island development states, you can think of them as actually large urban areas. Uh, and then with, with increased level of efficiency in the production systems, maybe do use some aquaculture, aquaponics, uh, vertical uh, agriculture, we need to be innovative and, and trying to produce in smaller areas. So I think uh, the keys are there, access to, to water, uh, trying to do urban gardens and trying to implement some type of technological solution that allows us to produce more in, in less area. Thank you, Asiento. Dr. Grant, you spoke about the decreasing catch and the potential economic fallout that, that might have happened as a result of what we've seen from the studies. A question coming from the, 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 the audience. With decreasing fish species comes the greater risk of IUU fishing or unreported, unregulated fishing. What what are, if any, measures in, that are being put in place across the region to, po to police this practice? And where do, do these plans cover? And how can they find these plans additional? OK, thank you for that um, question. Thank you. Um, well, IUU fishing is very important to us. Um, Yesterday, at the, during the CWA, um, the Caribbean Week of Agriculture, we had a, a, a ministerial, high level ministerial meeting that looked at IUU fishing and the country is committed to deter and to prevent and to eradicate IUU fishing throughout this region. So that is center and foremost. We have the Week of the Regional Plan of Action that is um, assisting us as well. I mean, that we are used, utilizing as member states to
to help to overcome IUU fishing. So yes, that is part of the agenda. That is another coin um, and, and another aspect of it that we are trying to, to, to address at the, within, this, within the, the region. A number of documents can be found on our website as it relates to IUU fishing. Um, the second part, the, in terms of the policy. Did I answer everything, Sean? I, I think you addressed the question, um, Dr. Grant, but I wanna follow on with, with a, 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 another question. And what has been asked, what is the potential as it relates to aquaculture to help mitigate the project, projections on fisheries impact due to climate change? Well, we as a region realize that um, aquaculture is, is, is another source of us getting um, fish for fish production. And so we have the plan of action for aquaculture throughout the region. Um, we are pushing for, um, we talked, my, the first speaker talked about hydrophonics and hydrophonics is also another way of producing fish, but also producing your vegetables. And we talk about the small footprints that we can do in order to produce fish, but also food for um, our communities. So yes, we are focusing a lot on, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in terms of aquaculture within the region. But again, there are the limitations and the constraints and the challenges due to whether it's finances, whether it's te technical expertise, um, um, knowledge, land availability, and again, back to the availability of water. So these are some of the constraints that we have for the aquaculture sector. Thank you much. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with you with this question. What technologies are currently available and are in the pipeline to address water stress challenges that are current and to come? Thank you. Yes, I think uh, in terms of aquaculture, it has a great potential because it is a way to safeguard the fish stocks while producing um, fish for local consumption and also you know for the tourism sector tourism industry if it's uh, done at scale so definitely it's an option that needs to be uh, pursued in the region we are we're in a couple of projects trying to address that directly so for example in this uh, project that i managed sponsored by the government of mexico we are promoting aquaculture in Dominica, in Trinidad and Tobago, in San Kitts and Nevis, um, and, and also in, um, in, in Antigua and Barbuda. And the idea is that uh, we just start producing, uh, we're just ensuring that aquaculture uh, has a more potential, or greater potential in the market in these countries. Sorry, it's Dominica and Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, the, other, the other aspect is in terms of the water energy food nexus. Yesterday in the Caribbean Week of Agriculture, we presented some options that we are promoting uh, for, for that aspect. So how do we bridge, use solar uh, technology, we use efficient irrigation systems, and if we include these mixed systems when you can produce uh, crops and uh, fish, for example, then we have a win-win situation. So that we want to, get data, create data, and scale this up in the region. That's basically the approach. I guess I could follow on with Dr. Cashman and ask, what are the innovations as, as put to us that exist both current and, and um, in the pipeline to deal with the challenges that we have in for water stress and, and water insecurity? Mm -hmm. uh, thank, thank you for that. I, I saw one of the questions was sort of related to this on non-revenue water and water loss. Uh, and there are actually a number of initiatives in the, in the, going on in the Caribbean at the moment. There's money from the Green Climate Fund. Jamaica has is, is got a big uh, water, reduction, uh, water loss reduction program going on at the moment. I think one has to emphasize that these things take a long time to take effect. I mean, we're talking seven years, maybe 10, maybe 10 years. But the innovations are actually in the use, in the gathering and the use of data and the analysis of data that we need to do that to be to make smarter decisions and to inform the decisions that that we're making and we're seeing that starting to starting to roll out that the other aspect it's not only 
technology. We talk very much in the water sector about demand, water demand management. And water demand management is not only about technology, but it's about changing behaviors. It's, it's how do you encourage positive behavior and how do you um, discourage negative behaviors? And we have a number of, of, of um, tools for that. So it's not just about technology. Technology is not the solution for, for everything. It has to be coupled with behavioral change and, and encouragement to do the right thing. So I would just end with that. I'm, I'm running up on time, but there are two final questions. One is a little bit provocative, and uh, the other has to, and the other is a follow on. And it's, it's for any other panelists. Do you think the Caribbean region needs to go to a mechanism that deals with water, water rights, as who has rights to water as opposed to do who doesn't? I think that's a provocative question that we should ask. And I'll invite any other panelists to, to take a, a, a job at it, but Bear in mind, we don't have a lot of time, but there's a job at it. Um, that's a very provocative question indeed, especially when you think that the, in fact, water, water is, nobody owns water. We are, uh, the, the gov governments are actually the stewards of, of water on behalf of the people of, of, their, of their nations. I think it, it, it's, I would not go down the route of water rights. What I would look at is mechanisms that look at water sharing and water sharing mechanisms uh, between, between sectors. I think that would be a, a much more fruitful approach than granting water rights because I, I see that um, as a very div divisive uh, step forward, if I can put it that way, and that's but that's just my personal view. Asian to and Dr. Grant, and then I'll do one final question as time is is getting up on us. Your thoughts I, on on the provocative question? Yes, I think uh, I'll probably not get into the whole detail of that. I would just add that in terms of water management, we really need to work on using the water at the quality level where where it's best needed or most useful. And a lot of times we're using uh, very clean, very pure water for uses that uh, don't necess necessarily need that level of quality. And if we start working on that, uh, there is more water to be distributed. And if we start using uh, rainwater harvesting, for example, uh, instead of just flushing through uh, the small islands, then it becomes a, a solution. So I think we can find ways and uh, I do agree with Adrian in terms of not going to the extremes and trying to manage. Thank you. Dr. Grant. Yes, I, I agree with my, my co-host. Um, I'll have to single out, I mean, especially for rural communities, I have to, 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 to zoom in a little bit on the water harvesting. I mean, we have a lot of people say, oh, we have rivers, we have, we have water. But we, I think we need to look at the small things that we can do in order to improve, um, to increase the amount of water availability for our people. And I'll ask if the final question, and, and this is a follow on. And this is directly from our audience in, in, in the virtual space. Do, na do nature protection organizations have any say in, policy, in the policy making decision process in the Caribbean in relation to water management? Water. <laughs> um, again, I'll jump in where others may fear to tread on this one. Um, <laughs> I would put the question in a little a different way. Is the question, do they or should they? Because if we are asking, do they have a say? I would give you the answer, no, they do not have a say. Um, much of the decision-making around water resources management is held at the government level. And this goes, there are a whole slew of issues around this, around accountability, tran, uh, uh, trans, uh, transparency, and all the rest of it. If the question is, should they, then I very much believe, and it is actually integral to integrated water resources management, that people should have a say in the management of water resources. So very much, if the question is, should they? 
Absolutely. Yeah. I see and try to put you on the spot. Yes. Um, I think it's, I used to work for WWF uh, when I was in Mexico. And the interesting thing about that organization is that it was actually looking to work with government. It was uh, proposing uh, things to, to make things better for, for conservation in different aspects. So I think we need that type of organization, uh, not, to, not that we need WWF, but that we need the type of organization that wants to engage uh, with government, propose solutions uh, that are geared towards conservation and um, innovative approaches. And I think governments are, are usually reactive and uh, accepting of, of such proposals when they can be balanced with their, their needs. So uh, we definitely need more engagement of civil society in the Caribbean, I think. Dr. Grant, I give you, I give you a quick sentence <laughs> to trot where nobody wants to trot. Um, I think so. There's room for them. As everybody says, there's room for them. Um, I think there's also room for communities as well to participate. So there is room for everybody to, to, to come together and decide how well to best to utilize the water that we have. And I agree with the others. But Sean, just before you go though, I want to touch on the last question, which is more my, uh, in my field. Go ahead, go ahead. But we're running out of time, so I'm allowing you to go. Go ahead. Two seconds. Two seconds. So yes, the um, MPAs have been shown to be very useful as a, adapt, a climate adaptation tools. I can name a number of countries that we have MPAs, such as Jamaica, um, Belize, and some other countries. I know in Belize, the government has um, agreed to a 14% of total area, total sea area as protected area. Um, I know we have the issue of it enforcing these areas, but I know we have seen the spill-off effects of these um, MPAs. So there is the space for MPAs in climate adaptation. Panelists, we've, we've come to the end, quite exciting. We could, we could go on and we could ask provocative questions that would lead us down to the, the path we want to go. However, we only had an hour. Quite interesting, we've been taken through the, the rigors of water insecurity and its effect on food insecurity and certainly health throughout the Caribbean region. The panelists have taken us from the sea in, inland. We have seen what the challenges are as it relates to water availability. We've seen what the challenges are in relation to climate change and what it's doing to the fisheries and marine sector. A lot more to be said. We want to say thank you to all our panelists, all our audience who have been online with us, who have submitted their questions. And we also want to say thank you to the Yale Center for climate change. And I invite everybody to con continue um, participating in this webinar, Climate Change and Health in Small Island Developing States. Focus on the Caribbean. Again, this week being the Caribbean Week of Agriculture, it is fitting, it is timely. And I thank you. I wish you all the best for the remainder of the week. Thank you much. Do enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.